This is Health Call Online, the place where you hear extended versions of interviews featured in our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour. I am glad you're here. We're talking today about your skin. It is the single largest organ system in your body. It's got a tough job to do, keep all the bad stuff out and all the good stuff in. And when it goes wrong, there may be need for you to see a doctor. Do you need to see a dermatologist? Eh, probably not, at least at first. Let's find out more about that by talking to Dr. Jared Wegman. He is the founder of Indiana Direct Primary Care, a different type of uh, physician experience that we'll talk about in just a second. Dr. Jared, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So uh, tell me a little bit about skincare in your office. Uh, is that a leading reason that people see their doctors? Yeah, I think it's a leading reason and at least five, maybe 10 percent of cases that people come to the, the doctor's office, although oftentimes when we get into visits, especially um, your routine kind of physical visits, we like to talk about general skin care as well. So you bring it up. You talk about skin care. That's interesting. I guess a lot of doctors wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's just, again, you mentioned it's one of the biggest organs we have in our body. And as patients get older, it's uh, important to do kind of regular skin checks. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking back to the last uh, physical I had with a traditional uh, family practice doctor, and there was no examination of my skin, no let me have a look at you kind of thing. And I thought, well, that's odd, that's missing. And um, I'm glad to hear that's something that you believe in that you do. You also have kind of a special interest in background in dermatology. Tell me about that. So I started in high school. I had some skin issues myself, and I had a dermatologist that uh, I saw, and I was really interested in skin-related issues at that time. So I actually did some shadowing with my dermatologist, uh, but even back when I was in high school. And I continued that through college and then as well through my medical training. I actually worked with him. In addition to my normal residency training, I spent an additional month uh, and a half with the dermatologist just to learn more about skin conditions, treatments, uh, and things like that. It's something that I really... Um, have a special interest in. So what do most people get wrong about treating skin conditions? I think most people uh, will jump to kind of over-the-counter things that they think may work for them. Uh, so, you know, grabbing the hydrocortisone off the counter, grabbing Benadryl off the counter, especially the Benadryl. Um, guilty, guilty. Yep, yep, the Benadryl creams um, are, are sometimes uh, can be can do more harm than good, uh, depending on what's there. And um, oftentimes infection related stuff comes up as well. So people treat it like it's a um, allergy or 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 maybe a, a reaction to something, but it's actually infection. And it's something that needs to be evaluated and treated appropriately. Oh, let's back up and talk about each one of those issues. So a hydrocortisone cream is a very low intensity, low uh, content of a, a steroid that's designed to kind of suppress inflammation, right? So how is that improperly used? So, yeah, there's a lot of great uses for hydrocortisone cream. We use it all the time. You know, there are specific uh, prescription versions of it as well. Uh, so it is an important part of treatment plans. It's, it's inappropriately used uh, in cases where it may be fungal. Uh, fungal reactions may not be um, apparent to people. They're a little bit different in the way they look typically. But oftentimes, if you put a steroid on a fungal uh, rash, the rash actually gets worse. Uh, same thing about when we look at infection. Uh, oftentimes, when we put an anti-inflammatory on an infectious lesion, the infectious lesions might look better um, from a redness standpoint, uh, but the infection is still there. And so that becomes a bigger issue where that infection continues to grow, and it may, in, in general, initially look better, but it, it's going to get worse. So what's a, what is the right use or the appropriate use for a hydrocortisone cream? So inflammatory conditions, oftentimes people will uh, get into things in the yard. Uh, for instance, uh, some people are allergic to grasses, some people obviously poison ivy, poison oak, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, oftentimes hydrocortisone works really well for those. Eczema, for instance, is another great condition where we utilize, you know, hydrocortisone cream uh, in addition to doing normal moisturizing and, uh, and, and other treatments as well. So, man, there's so much to talk about there. Let's go back to on that one a second. Fungal infections are far more common than people might ordinarily think. Uh, ringworm is probably the most frequent, uh, most common, and it sounds creepy, but it's not a parasite at all, right? 
Correct. Yep. It's just a fungal reaction that people have. It's very common uh, in kids, especially. Uh, we see it oftentimes in wrestlers in school, just because of that close contact. You know, funguses do really well in warm, moist environments, and that is, um, you know, summertime like we're in now is a, is a great time for those things to crop up and something to look for. People often think ringworm has to look like a, a ring, and it doesn't always. Uh, so it's definitely something you want to look at in the office if things aren't getting better. There's nothing wrong with trying to treat stuff at home, but when things aren't getting better, it's time to come in and, and let us evaluate it. And then the over-the-counter fungal antifungals are uh, pretty effective on ringworm as well, right? Yeah, for the most part, very effective. Every once in a while, depending on the, the burden of it, if there's a lot, uh, you know, we need to go to some by mouth or oral therapy. Uh, but oftentimes using the creams is going to help. The thing about fungus is typically we need to treat a little bit longer. Um, even though those creams are very good at doing what they do, oftentimes it will take weeks uh, before those go away completely. Oh, got it. So even though it, it, it's not looking as angry, don't give up on the treatment. Yeah, you want to make sure that it's completely gone before you give up. Eczema is a very common complaint, but that's really kind of a broad umbrella term, isn't it? It's not a specific condition per se. Yeah, eczema is actually what we call um, the itch that rashes. Um, so it's very weird. Um, oftentimes people will itch before a rash comes out. And so when they do that, um, it kind of gives us a good idea that, that it is eczema related. Uh, eczema typically has a pattern to it. It's usually in the flexor portions of joints. Uh, it can be anywhere, but oftentimes if you see it in the crease of the elbow and the, and the armpit and the, you know, behind the knees, those are very commonly eczema type rashes. And then what is the, what's the fix? I guess there's multiple causes, so there could be multiple fixes. Yeah, absolutely. So oftentimes uh, when, you know, babies come out and, you know, they have real, real dry skin, you know, they may develop what we call eczema uh, as kids. And so moisturization is probably the biggest key. Um, and I would say that, you know, carries through through your entire life, you know, making sure your skin is well moisturized and well taken care of. Again, it's your largest immune organ. And when things dry out and cause problems, you know, you have the risk of, you know, gaining infection and other things through that. So moisturization is probably the first key. Um, second key is we'll use uh, anti-inflammatory things like hydrocortisone. There are other newer anti-inflammatory things that aren't steroid-based, um, more expensive, obviously, but for, you know, large conditions where we don't want to put, you know, steroids all over the place, um, we can utilize those. And then a lot of what we see over time, especially with kids initially, there may be some dietary things that need to change. There may be some food allergies, there may be some environmental allergies and things um, that we need to treat. And if we treat those allergies by eliminating foods from the diet and or you know, just providing an allergy medication, oftentimes the eczema itself will get better. Let's, let's drill down on that just a little bit. So I know one of the keys of your practice is trying to get to the underlying cause and that sort of an integrative holistic approach. Tell me how you might approach that with uh, somebody who has a real ongoing problem with eczema. So oftentimes we look at um, gut issues as well. So people that have allergies oftentimes won't just have skin issues, they'll have gut issues. And it's not something they often uh, bring up because they find it as pretty normal for them. It's something that they've dealt with for a long period of time and they just think it's kind of who they are. And so when we get into talking about those gut issues, we, we sort of you know, dive into diet and what you know of the things in their diet may be causing that. Now, it's not always apparent. Um, sometimes I actually refer people off to do some testing for uh, food allergies. And sometimes that starts with even the over-the-counter test, food allergy testings that you can get. There's a number of different brands out there. At least it gives you an initial idea. And then if we need to go further with that with uh, some of the medical testing, then we can do that. But it's, it's much cheaper to, to initially screen with some of those over-the-counter um, allergy testing kits. You know, I'm, I'm kind of out of the loop on that. I didn't even know that those existed. How do they work? So it depends. Uh, there's a couple that are uh, DNA based. So it's like a cheek swab that you can send in. And there are a couple that you actually do a, a prick to your uh, finger and put little dots on a card and send it in that way. So uh, depends on the test. Both of them are, you know, at least a, an initial screen uh, for these food allergies. Nothing's perfect, uh, but these are you know, again, for 120 to 180 dollars, I think is what they sort of range. Uh, you can get a pretty good idea of things that you might be uh, sensitive to. What type of foods typically will show up in those screens? 
So the big ones now obviously are milk, uh, wheat, um, peanuts, or tree nuts of, of certain kinds. Those are the kind of the big ones that you notice, but it will come through with fruits, um, you know, strawberries. I mean, other, you know, things that are, are normal part of people's diet that, uh, that you wouldn't think. So what are some symptoms, signs that uh, my skin problems might re be related to what's going on in my gut? So it's hard to know for sure, but again, if you've got some gut issues uh, related to that, so even things as simple as heartburn, people that have heartburn on a pretty regular basis, that can be related to, you know, a food sensitivity, um, you know, gut issues from in the forms of going to the bathroom, you know, chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, kind of a combination of both. Bloating is a huge issue for people, um, and that can be related to food allergies that, again, can be related to skin. There are certain inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, that can be related to skin conditions as well. Obviously, those are a little bit more serious, and, and you know, those are, are, are a little more obvious sometimes. You know, people have, you know, blood in their stool that they will ignore for a while. So those are, are big things that you want to bring up. It's not an embarrassing topic for doctors, you know, and it's not normal to have that. Uh, so we want to know about it. So, yeah, using your skin as sort of a... Um an indicator of internal problems. Pretty, pretty interesting idea there. What, what other skin conditions might hint to something going on inside me? So there are a few uh, different skin conditions that you can have um, related to diabetes. Um, they sometimes will develop as darkening of the skin in certain areas. Oftentimes, in the back or kind of in the back of the neck area, you'll see that. Uh, and that kind of gives us an idea. There are uh, little lesions that um, kind of crop up that are kind of yellowish in nature that can lead to diagnosis of high cholesterol levels. Um, so a couple different things that can, that can show up over time. You know, there are, uh, again, things like psoriasis. So people with really severe arthritis um, oftentimes may have psoriasis or psoriasis type lesions. So you get that psoriatic arthritis. Um, so a number of different conditions we can look at through the skin. Yeah, let's talk just a second here about psoriasis. That is an autoimmune reaction where your skin kind of goes crazy and starts overproducing cells in specific areas. So uh, how do I know that that's what I have if I haven't been diagnosed? And then let's talk about treatment. Yeah, so psoriasis is a very um, specific type of kind of scaly lesion that we see. Um, it's something that you probably can't self-diagnose, but you may know about it if it's familial. Uh, it oftentimes does run in family, although there's, there's new diagnosis in, in families as well. So when we look at psoriasis, we, there's a couple different you know, treatments. Um, one of the things that people might notice at home if they have psoriasis is that when they're out in the sun, their lesions oftentimes get better. Um, so some people actually try to suntan or, or go to the tanning bed uh, to try to help these lesions. That's not always the best thing, um, just from a you know, skin cancer standpoint when you look down the road. But ultimately, it's something that people can look at and like, oh, my skin gets better when I'm out in the sun. Uh, Treatment-wise for psoriasis is very similar to eczema. We use uh, utilize steroid and, and some of the new non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatory medications. If it's bad enough, there's biologics now. So people with the psoriatic arthritis, for instance, um, you know, that actually is destructive to joints. It's a little bit different than what we see with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is just a general breakdown of joints over time. Psoriatic arthritis is actually destructive to joints and it can, you know, cause joint deformities uh, over time. So, you know, tackling that sometimes requires something more significant like a biologic medication. And those are, uh, yeah, I'm going to call those the more serious skin conditions, but there are a lot of minor issues that you as a direct primary care physician can deal with a little bit differently. So if, if folks aren't aware in direct primary care, at least in your practice, uh, I happen to be a member, so I know, I pay a flat monthly fee, $99, and then I have access to you and all the services you can perform in the office at no additional charge. Uh, so explain to me how that comes to a benefit if, as I'm dealing with skin-related issues. 
Sure. So there's a lot of annoying uh, little skin issues that people have. Skin tags, for instance, are just these, um, you know, kind of little um, tags of skin that hang off oftentimes in areas of skin that have rubbing. So whether that's under the arm, at the neckline, uh, people will develop these. They tend to be familial too, although again, anybody can get them. Uh, and it's something that in a normal doctor's office, if you wanted to get rid of because it's an annoying issue and not necessarily a quote health problem, um, it's considered cosmetic and cosmetic things and doctor's offices are always more expensive where when we look at our office, you know, it's $99 a month. It's kind of all in. We'll do those skin procedures for no additional charge. Uh, we'll remove those. Same things when we look at these, you know, people call them age spots or liver spots, um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they're kind of um, you know annoying. Sometimes the people from a cosmetic reason just want them taken off. And again, it's more cosmetic, so it's going to be more money in other practices where you know we can kind of tackle those pretty easily in the office. There's not there's not a huge risk associated with taking these off. Uh, a little bit more time, but we have that time. Yeah, talk to me about those age spots. So you're talking here, I think, about the the dark sort of thick, scaly, raised areas that we see as people age. What's what's going on with that? So it's just a uh, your body's response, and again, more familial. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them, so to speak. Um, it's just it, it just kind of people. Some people have moles. Some people have freckles. Some people get these age bots over time, um, and they look like they're what they, we call them stuck on lesions. They look like they're literally this kind of just brown or kind of uh, skin colored fleshy thing. It's just kind of stuck on top of the skin. If you just pick at it, sometimes they actually come off, uh, but they oftentimes regrow. And so that's where the treatment comes in that we take them off. We call them seborrheic keratoses, um, but again, most people call them age spots or you know liver spots. And what's the what's the process in your office? How do you remove them? A couple different ways we can do it. Oftentimes, cryotherapy works pretty well. So cryotherapy is just when we freeze things off. Um, if they're small enough, that works pretty quickly and easily. Sometimes we'll need to treat it a couple times, uh, but ultimately we can always, you know, shave them off and then treat them with a little bit of cryotherapy underneath to kind of help them prevent from growing back. So when do you think is it appropriate for me to see a dermatologist as opposed to trusting my primary care guy? So I think um, there's a number of conditions, like you mentioned, um, you know, oftentimes primary care, we don't do biologics. Um, you know, that's something that's a little bit more specialized. That's something that we would refer off to the dermatologist. Um, any lesions that are large in size that require uh, a more surgical technique to remove. Um, anytime that you have biopsies done in the primary care office, you know, we can do biopsies a, a lot. But if you have a biopsy where we end up having, you know, a basal cell, uh, for instance, that's something that we would refer you off to dermatology office. Or if we know it's a basal cell, sometimes we'll refer you off because they'll have to do something called a Mohs procedure, um, which is where they remove that. They actually look at things under the microscope while they do it to make sure they get the entire lesion. And then, of course, you know, when we look into more serious conditions like melanomas, uh, melanomas, if we have concerns for those, again, primary care doctor's office, we can do biopsies for those. But oftentimes, if I'm concerned about that, I'll send them off to the dermatologist because it's a lot more involved to get rid of those lesions. And then there's more uh, background things that need to be done to make sure those lesions, lesions haven't spread. Um, I know you want to talk just a second about uh, sunscreens. I've uh, done some reading on sunscreens and found that uh, the formulations in Europe are often quite a bit different than what is here in the United States. And European sunscreens are supposedly a lot more effective than here. And then your concern is related to the over-the-counter products here and some of what they contain. Tell me more about that. So yeah, there's been a number of research on different sunscreens out there, and I think they're generally considered as safe. Um, however, when you look at these and, and dive deep into them, there, there are some potential concerns, especially with the benzones that are related to some of the sunscreens over the counter. Um, you know, those have been related, at least in animal studies, for uh, you know, certain cancers, certain reproductive issues, certain liver and kidney things. Um, and obviously, I don't think anybody's bathing in these things routinely, but uh, it's just something to consider. And you're right, you know, just like food in our country, you know, other countries more strictly regulate these things. And I think... Uh, pay more attention to what's in the products they use than we do here in America. And, you know, the safest ones, if you're really looking at things, are the mineral sunscreens. Uh, those are the ones that nobody likes to use because it's the, the kind of thick white uh, stuff that kind of, yeah. you know, kind of changes your color. But um, ultimately, they're the safest ones to use. That's the one we often use in kids. Um, you'll see out there in the kids' versions of sunscreens are mostly mineral-based. 
So mineral based, uh, that's the uh, zinc oxide. Is that that white stuff you always used to see on the uh, lifeguard's nose? Is that what we're talking about? Yep, that's exactly what it is. So the ones that are kind of a pain uh, to get on, they're a little thicker. They're, you know, they have that white nature to them, but um, those are generally considered pretty safe. Got it. Got it. Um, you know, I love to, I, I ask this question to all the, all the professional guests that we have on the program. How do you live differently? What do you do differently with your knowledge of all the derm issues you've treated over, over life? How do you care for your skin differently? So honestly, when I was younger, uh, you know, I, I was kind of the kid who was out in the sun, didn't use sunscreen, you know, ran around and, and, and I'm paying for that now a little bit. You know, I've got uh, some skin issues that I need to follow. And so what I do now is I've just learned to protect my skin, uh, starting out with the basics. I mean, moisturization to make sure the skin is, is healthy. And when you look at moisturizers, you know, it, it can be as simple as you know, coconut oil. Um, coconut oil is a great moisturizer. It actually has some, um, some antibacterial components to it, which is great, uh, but a little bit greasy when you get down to it. Uh, and there are a lot of other products over the counter that you'll find that are, that are great for moisturization. Oftentimes, as physicians, we lean to the ones that don't have a lot of stuff in them. Uh, when you look at them, you know, we're looking at things like Aquaphor and Cetaphil uh, are two brands that are, are pretty good that don't have a lot of fragrances and a lot of other special things in them. Uh, that's not to say the other ones are bad, but, you know, I always, my moniker is simple is better. Um, simple is easier. So same thing when I look at my food, uh, you know, I'm looking at the ingredients and if there are 15 or more ingredients Probably not for me. Uh, yeah. I want things to be fairly simple. So, uh, so that's what I do. You know, I start with the basics and then move forward from there. And then when I have something that I find, you know, on my body that changes, um, that I think is new, is different uh, than some of the other, you know, moles or freckles that I do have. You know, I I, I go to my doctor. Yeah, and I think that's one of the key advantages of the direct primary care model uh, is that I'm not waiting weeks to get in to see you i know that i can get access to you right away and uh, either by phone i can even snap a picture of something on my body and send it to you and say hey doc should i worry about this that's a i think that's such a, such a tremendous benefit to the dry primary care model it's one of the things that won me over and that's one of the reasons i'm your patient i like all that access I'll send us out of here with um a factoid about skin that uh, we may not know Oh, gosh, that's a difficult one. Um, you know, I think there's a huge, um, you know, push for uh, these monikers about stroke um, and all these uh, different uh, mnemonics for stroke. And I think we're for skin, especially a lot of people do know this, but, you know, the ABCDE, um, the asymmetry, uh, basically, if any lesion doesn't have an equal side, if there's one half different than the other, you look at B as your border. So the border is real irregular uh, on a lesion. You know, sees the color. You know, if it's multiple different colors, that's unusual. Um, if there's a very, very dark color, that's also unusual and something you want to have a look at. Uh, D is diameter. So when you look at the diameter of a lesion, if it's greater than six millimeters, I know in this country we don't use uh, millimeters that often, but it's definitely something, usually like a pencil eraser head is what they say. Okay. So larger than that. Um, and then E is just evolving. Uh, is it changing over time? Is it growing? Is it doing something that's different than the other lesions that you have? Um, those are things that, you know, we look for um, and just to kind of keep monitoring. All right, the ABCDEs of skin care from Dr. Jared Wegman from Indiana Direct Primary Care. You'll find them online at indianadirectprimarycare.com. Doctor, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again.